Gas fitter exam cramp session, video three. Okay, we're talking about the 2014 code, the tables in the code. Not just purging lengths, but tables in general as far as the New York City construction codes go. The 2014 code replaced the 2008 code. The 2008 code, the brainchild of, uh, well, not the code itself, but New York actually having an up-to-date current code, the brainchild of Mayor Bloomberg. Before then, we had the 1968 code, antiquated. Uh, full of loopholes that, well, this is New York City, most corrupt city in the world, lots of highly intelligent individuals making out like bandits. Okay, so Bloomberg said, we're going to curtail that, we're going to bring our code up to the modern era. Okay, um, the code itself, uh, let's say we have the 2008. The 2008, usually a code starts, uh, its effective date is in December. I think the 2008 was something like uh, October, the 2014 was uh, December 6th. The 2020 code, which we should have had by now, but obviously there's a lot of things that should have happened by now, but they're not. So we still got the 2014. Had we had the 2020, it would have started midnight of December 31st, 2020. But these codes, uh, they go through, when they're changed um, under Bloomberg, uh, it was established that we were going to, uh, every three years, change the code. So, um, the 2008, in 2011, everyone gets together, they start working on the code, and then it takes about three years from that point before the code is actually published, um, sent out, etc. So that's why we have six years between. So every three years, yes, every th we have a code. It stays, in a, it stays the way it is for three years. And then there's a revision process for another three years. So every six years. When they change the codes, uh, we'll go through notation in the code much later. Um, but when they do change the codes, You'll notice it, they'll actually make notations in the margins showing a change from the previous code, a change from the international code uh, version of it. What they don't change are mistakes in the tables. The mistakes in the tables that I will point out to you much later when we deal with the actual code itself, those were in the 2008 version. Uh, I was looking forward to seeing them fixed in the 2014. They were not fixed. So. What does this tell us about, uh, not necessarily the test maker, but what's going on over there in the floors that the Department of Building occupies in the David N. Dinkins Municipal Building, right across the street from City Hall. It tells us that I think when they are updating the code, that it's also the days, some days, that falls on the days of bring your kid to work day. And I think they give the tables to the kids and tell them, fix this. And that's probably why they don't get fixed. Okay. So, uh, with that said, we talked about purging. We have plenty of opportunities to talk about it more. But, let's go on to the next question. Turn the page. Page 14. Question 4. The testing pressure for gas distribution pressures over half a PSI through five PSI is 50 PSI for 30 minutes. I cannot stress enough how you need to burn these testing pressures into your psyche. You need to know these better than you know your name. You're going to be asked without a doubt several, several times in the test in several ways that they could possibly imagine how to do it. Testing pressures. Because this test is difficult. Chapter 4 is not a small chapter. The fuel gas code is not a small code. But um, another one of these videos, I'll show you what the, the building code looks like. And you'll uh, what the plumbing code, mechanical code looks like. And you'll see that the fuel gas code is not that big a code when it's standing next to some of the other codes in the entire construction code library. So, 
eventually there's only so many questions you can ask so now you got to start figuring out you got to ask them in a different way you got to turn it around a little instead of asking maybe in a in the uh, glasses half full way you'll ask in the glasses half empty way so you need to know these pressures so it's not you know you're not wasting valuable time trying to recall this information you're now spending that brain power on trying to figure out okay how are they trying to use the wording to mess me up okay this uh it boils down to like you know what we say uh, carpet baggers a uh, snake oil salesman you know it's like they'll just use the words they'll they'll, they'll uh, beguile you with their words so testing pressures in both the book and the PDF, if you go to the back cover, you're going to see I actually have the testing pressures laid out for you. In as little uh, um, extraneous information as possible, nice, clear, and simple. So, since we are on testing pressures, how about we go through all of them? You're going to need to know all of them. Let's go through all of them and start developing a feel for the testing pressures. Okay? If you're working on a gas system, whether you're working on an existing or a new, there's no way you're going to turn it on without proving that it holds gas in front of somebody who's going to be who's going to attest that yeah, it holds gas, okay? So, this test is mandatory. This test is going to happen. You're going to do it. Uh, and uh, it's going to it's going to be witnessed. Okay, you're not going to get away with anything. So let's do it right the first time, and we don't have to waste time with bullshit. All right. The pressure you're going to be working most with is up to half a psi. In fact, it's uh, it's a blanket statement. If you got gas running inside a building, half a psi is as high as you go. Yes. You're going to have higher pressures, but once again, that falls in the exceptions or, you know, because of this, you're allowed that or whatever. But generally, it's always going to be half a PSI. And in systems where it, the max is half a PSI, that's still kind of a lot. Okay. Generally, in systems that the max is half, you're generally running at a quarter, a quarter PSI or seven inches on your manometer. That little funny tube with the green colored water in it. Uh, usually you see the utility guys come out and they'll have it, okay? It goes up to around 7 because it's usually what the pressure is going to be when it's going to the stove or to, you know, your, uh, your uh, residential boiler. If you got half a PSI, they usually don't like that because, guess what, a manometer is open to atmosphere. It works on atmospheric pressure. Half a PSI will just shoot the water right out and they get pissed, so quarter of a PSI. Half a PSI makes them nervous. All right, so we say we're uh, up to half a PSI, okay? That's the max, right? If that's the system you're running, you're going to have to test it at three PSI for 30 minutes. Three PSI for half an hour, okay? Easy enough to remember, that's going to be a start point. Half a PSI system, got to pump it up to 3 PSI, 30 minutes. What if we got a system that's higher than half a PSI? Okay, well, the next increment is we got a system that's higher than PS, half a PSI and goes up to 5 PSI. Okay, if we're going up to 5 PSI, 50 PSI for 30 minutes, okay? So, we already start seeing uh, an affinity here, right? 3 for 30, 5 for 50, this doesn't change, okay? So, the next one, well, what if we got something that's over 5 PSI? Okay, if we got something that's over 5 PSI, but not greater than 15 PSI, half, five, 15, powers of 10, K, 
Okay, 5, 50, 30, 30. You start seeing this in your, in your mind, you know, you can even, uh, even if you don't, this, you can memorize a table, but you can also, in your mind's eye, just see the photo of the table. Just, you've seen, you start looking at this enough, you start writing this out enough, you're going to start getting a feel for like, uh, you know, you can go through the actual numbers in your head. But sometimes you can just sit there and see the table and look at the table. I wouldn't say it's like photographic memory. There really is no such thing. But you can see something, just a picture of it in your head, and then look at the picture in your head instead of trying to go straight from your head to a picture in the real world via you trying to recall information. So, 3, 30, 5, 50, 30, 30. 5, 15, powers of 5, 5, next one is 15. Now, why the line? Because this is where the party ends, okay? 30 minutes, that was fun. But guess what? Now, it's 100 PSI for an hour, one hour. Okay, 60 minutes, one hour. Okay, let's talk about two things here. Okay, first of all, the testing times. When we're testing uh, and we're, we have times, um, this is a very popular time throughout the codes. If we're going to be testing a standpipe, a sprinkler system, um, you know, uh, domestic water systems, you're going to see an hour. Now, in the 2008 code, it seems like we're getting off the subject, but it's actually very pertinent. In the 2008 code, uh, as far as sprinkler and standpipe testing was concerned, there were situations that you were holding a test for two hours. Now in the 2014, that changed. No more two hours. Everything was one hour. So, we got to read between the lines. All right, what does this tell us? This puts us in the mindset of the Department of Buildings, who, well, they're making this test, but they're also part of the city. Uh, it's a test concern with the city. So this, this kind of, uh, if we try to get into the mind of our opponent, it kind of gives us uh, some kind of idea of, like, maybe in general how the city works and the thinking behind the exams and how we should approach it because, you know, we, we can't make up our own answers. The only right answers are the ones they say are right. So we got to give them what they want. The better we know them, the better we can give them what they want. So I would say that the reason why one hour is so popular is because I'm guessing the inspectors had some really important lunches to go to because, you know, you meet up for lunch, you, you get your envelope, you know, you're good to go. Two hours is too long. An hour, boom, done. Go to a restaurant, get treated at steak dinner, you know, take your envelope and, you know, life goes on as normal in New York City. Okay, so one hour. All right. That should help you remember one hour. Okay. All right. So 15 PSI. A hundred PSI for an hour. Because this is a big, these are such small pressures that you would think like, you know, wow, if, if this was a uh, water, if we had a domestic water system, at 15 psi, we don't only have to, to pressure test it at at, uh, at 30. Here, no, we got to go all the way up to 100. Gas is serious. Gas is dangerous. They want to know that that piping can hold at 100. Okay. Um, now, let's say we got something over 15 psi. If it's over 15 psi, right? over 15 psi we want twice the maximum operating pressure so let's say the system was going to go for 50 psi uh, maximum operating pressure not necessarily the uh normal working pressure but the maximum operating pressure you could see at any time in that system let's say it was uh, 25 PSI. 
then according to this, since we're saying two times the pressure, 25 PSI would mean we're going to test at 50. But I think you kind of look at this table and realize we're not going to get away that easy. We're not going to be able to test it at 50. We got to test it at 100 because not just twice the maximum working pressure, but no less than 100 PSI. So a system running at 25 PSI max, can't go to 50, got to go to 100. I know 25 is, two, is 50 is uh, 25 twice is 50, but you got to do 100, okay? So at least 100. Now, if we had a system running at 150 PSI, well, guess what? Yes, you're going to have to run it at 300 PSI for the sake of argument. Okay. Um, now, well, I did say, let's say we had a system running at 100 PSI. There is a stipulation for that. Okay. These are the raw numbers. These are the numbers you need to memorize. Now, let's say we did have a system. We're running it at uh, 150 PSI. Our test pressure would be uh, 300 PSI. But one more stipulation, okay? At pressures over 125 PSI, not only are you testing it at twice, in this case it would come out to 200, uh, 250, um, you also shall not exceed a value that produces a hoop stress greater than 50% of, min of the minimum yield strength. Okay, what do I mean there? Hoop stress. Okay, you know you got a barrel and you know that you got the uh, copper bands that go around it. Okay, the cooper, the guy who makes the barrels, he, puts, he has the rings, he puts the slats in and then tightens and everything's perfect. Or uh, if you're familiar with how they do roof tanks, the wooden roof tanks, wooden roof tanks pretty much a big giant barrel. That's what they are. They're, they're coopers for really ginormous barrels that are going to hold the water for the, uh, for the building. Hoop stress. Those rings there, well, we'll call them hoops, like hula hoops. So the hoop stress. So in other words, the pressure that causes, that exerts itself around the circumference of the pipe. So that pressure, the hoop stress. Just imagine a hula hoop or the uh, rings that the cooper puts around the barrel to hold the slats. All right, that hoop stress. Uh, you know, you can over pressurize for a test. I mean, steel pipe does have its limits. Everything has a limit. Uh, you're, so you're going to do twice the pressure, but because we can get into some really crazy pressures, we're not going to exceed the hoop strength of the pipe more than 50%. Let's say the hoop strength of the pipe is, I'm just pulling out numbers for uh, just uh, for visualization. Let's say the hoop stress is 1,000 PSI, okay? That's uh, the minimum yield strength of the, of the pipe. The hoop strength is 1,000 PSI. Well, then we can't test at 1,000 PSI. We can only test at 50% or half of that. So the test pressure would be 500 PSI. Okay, so even if double the max work pressure is higher than 100, I mean higher than 500, according to this, because the hoop stress, the minimum yield is 1,000, we're going to have to keep it at 500 and the code will be satisfied. That's a lot to remember. I only gave this to you to give you a general idea of what, what's going on. I'll tell you what, I said this is numerology, a game of numbers. The test doesn't know if you know what the hell you're talking about. The test only knows if you filled in the right bubble. Did you click on the right bubble? Good. It could have been by accident. You could be the luckiest guy in the world. Okay. These tests don't necessarily say that you're, you know, you're an extremely intelligent, smart gas fitter. They just said on that day, you happened to fill in the right bubble. So don't worry about hoop stress or this or that. Worry that when you see the question, you're looking for the key numbers. You're looking for, is this question asking me about pressures over 125 PSI? 
Good. Because I remember reading that somewhere. Is this thing asking me about hoop stress or yield strength or this or that stuff that, you know, was a little harder to remember than these nice raw numbers? Yes. Well, what did I remember about that? I know it said 50%. Well, guess what? It's one of those answers says 50% or half you know, or something to that effect. There's your right answer. Don't even really need to know. The stuff here, hope you understood it. If you didn't, don't worry. Over 125 PSI, no more than half the fucking strength of the pipe. Simple as that, okay? Still a couple more. You know, if you're looking at the table, you see we got two more things, okay? Meter piping. Ah. Let's say the test, and this is, this is general test taking strategy. Let's say on the day of the test, we never before saw meter piping. I know, you went through the book a million times, but you know, sometimes, you know, you just have a mental block towards some things and you never noticed that. You never saw that. Holy crap, what is the test pressure for meter piping? But you did pay attention when I mentioned the scope of the code. The code says we go from the point of delivery, which is the, uh, which is the outlet of the meter piping, to the most remote outlet. We did mention, we already talked about that, meter piping in the service, that's on the utility, okay? That's, that's, uh, that's their liability. So guess what? With that information in hand, if you were to somehow say, you know what, I'm just gonna take a healthy guess and say that, you know what, I think meter piping is not my fucking problem. I think that's Con Edison's problem. I think that's uh, National Grid's problem. And you're gonna pick an answer that reflects that. And if you pick, as per the utility, using either the pressure above or certifying to their requirements, you would be picking the right answer, even though you never saw this before, and you got to make an educated guess, because you did your studying, you don't have to depend on luck for the entire test. And luck likes that. If you walk into a test, and you think out of 50 questions, luck is going to help you pick the right answer for each one, wow, no. No, and you know, though I'm not, I, I wouldn't even give you five bucks for me to go uh, play the slots for me. Your luck is horrible. If you go to the test and you have never taken Lux calls, you have not responded to any of Lux emails, you pretty much uh, have decided that, you know, you don't want to deal with Luck because sometimes she's a crazy ass bitch. Luck is going to do everything in her power to get you to notice her on the day of the test because when it comes time to you hit that one or two questions where you just absolutely have no idea and you know as much as you don't like to deal with luck you kind of regret you know giving it a cold shoulder don't worry she's a little whore she'll help you out preparation brings its own luck depend on luck and you'll lose every time. Speaking of luck, basic probability theory. We have 50 questions. Each question has four choices. With nothing else said, your chances are one in four, because there's only one right answer, your chances are one in four of choosing the right answer for 25%. And contrary to a gambler's fallacy, Luck resets itself every time you throw the dice. You could have been throwing, I don't know what's a good number in craps, but let's say, I'm going to say seven is a good, lucky seven. Seven is a good number in craps. You could be throwing seven, 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 seven. As lucky as that seems, because that's extremely highly unlikely, but let's say it happens. That has no bearing unless the dice are loaded, but we're going to assume they're not, that, unless the table's rigged or there's magnets somewhere, but we're not going to worry about that. I'm going to say it's a completely fair game. The next roll is whatever the next roll is going to be. It could be another seven. That is possible. Anything is possible. But not because the previous rolls were sevens. Not because you're extremely lucky but because probability resets itself and you just happen to step in dog shit that day and you're rolling nothing but sevens, okay? Every time you roll the dice, probability resets itself. So, 
With that in mind, every question has exactly a 25% chance of you picking it right, which means on average, you could just fill in A for every single one. Just fill in A. You can get 25% of those questions right. Okay, you will, uh, if you get 25% of those questions right, uh, that's about, that's approximately, uh, that's approximately uh, 12 questions, give or take. So you can get a 24 on this exam. You need a 70 to pass, but we're worried about passing. We're about testing the uh, limits of probability and luck. And depending on it to pass this exam, I would say you don't, okay? Uh, luck, on average, at the very best, you know, you, you're only guaranteed a 24 on this exam, okay? Uh, you study, you go through the book, I can almost guarantee you an 85, all right? Um, let's see what else. I mean, uh, oh, and just to drive it home, the, uh, the probability, let's say um, I do something else. I don't fill in A, okay? And I'm not going to go with only fill in B, C, or D. It's, you get the idea. Let's say I managed to somehow have someone else take the test. Okay, I got a chimpanzee into that room to sit at that computer and bang on the mouse for the entire test. Even the chimpanzee could get a 24. He could get at least 12 right and a 24. Okay, so luck is not for us. That's not how we work. All right. Um, okay, so. We've already uh, we've gone through our test pressures, all right? I know it's one question, we only needed one answer, but each question is going to direct us to where and what the test maker is using and what he expects us to know and the kind of questions he's gonna ask, okay? So, it's again, question four. The testing pressure for gas distribution pressures over half a PSI, over but no higher than five PSI or through five PSI. Start getting used into your head of thinking and seeing and saying different ways because the test maker will also do that. You could get used to memorizing these questions exactly the way they were worded. But then what if they word them differently? It's the same information, but trust me, in a stress situation like a test, that wording could throw you off. Now you're not sure, you know? It's almost like, do you ever look at a word? This is a word you've seen all your life. You learned it in, I don't know, third grade. You spelled it right, finally. And you've been spelling it right all the time. You know how it's spelled. But then you're sitting there one day and you're looking at the word and suddenly it, it doesn't look like it's spelled right. You know, that weird thing happens in your head, in your mind, happens to everybody, totally normal, but you start looking at it too hard and you take it apart, your, your brain's taking it apart, doesn't make sense. It makes sense when your brain looks at it at one whole thing. You start taking it apart in your, in your head, it doesn't look like it's spelled right. But it's spelled right, that's just how your mind works sometimes. If a sentence is not phrased exactly the way you've been learning it over and over again, that could throw you off a little. So, I say distribution pressures over half a PSI through five PSI, but it could be over half a PSI, but not greater than five PSI, you know? Or over half a PSI up to and including five PSI. All mean the same thing. Get used to being flexible in your head as far as uh, English grammar, just writing a sentence is concerned, the test maker, they're gonna change up the wording on you possibly, okay? So over half a PSI through five PSI uh, is 50 PSI for 30 minutes. We saw the five, so five, 50, five, 50. The first two sets, we know the minimum, the lowest number we're working with, our reference point to start this table, one half. The next one is over one half to five PSI. Three is 30, 50, 30, okay. Question five. Question five. I may have a, 
I may have grouped 